I was walking around the financial district when I stumbled upon this strange device. Does anybody know what it is? It does not have any recognizable logos or marks, only the letters V1 written on one side and a USB connector on the other. Here's a photo. It probably is some kind of memory, but it has an unusual design. I will check it when I arrive at home. I finally arrived at home. I connected the USB device to my computer, but it looks like it is permanently locked. Now I'm curious about the device and its content. Would I be able to unlock it using fault injection? Hey guys, this was a reenactment of the story in the description of the Fiesta challenge from the Rescue Embedded Hardware CTF. I'm really excited about this one, so check it out. The device is permanently locked. We can imagine that the code could look something like this. A loop with a condition that will always be true, so an endless loop. And it just prints lock. Which sucks because we want to get to the code after the loop where it prints the secret. Clearly there's no way to reach that code ever. That's what a software developer would say, but bear with me. We will perform a hardware attack and glitch our way out of this loop. I'm so excited about this challenge, it was my favorite thing to experience and the perfect end to the Rescue Embedded Hardware CTF for me. Get ready to get your mind blown. I have some theoretical knowledge about hardware techs from university and also watched some conference talks about it. Which is just theoretical knowledge, but at least I had somewhat of a plan. So the challenge is a fault injection challenge, which means you kinda screw with the hardware so it does something wrong. And there are several ways how you can perform a fault attack. For example, you know from movies how an EMP can crash electronics. So trigger a small electromagnetic pulse to the chip and it might do something weird. Or the chip runs from a clock at a certain speed and weird things happen once you let it run faster than intended or a lot slower. But what I will do is a power glitch, which means I want to cut the power supply for a really short amount of time so that the device does not reset, but it does something weird. And so to do this, I need to build something. I choose to do it with an FPGA developer board that I have still laying around. An FPGA is for now, just like any other electronics board, something that you can program to do whatever you want. In my case, I want to use the switches to control the length of the power cut and a button as a trigger. And I want to use a single wire as an output of the FPGA to control an electronic switch that turns on or off the power supply, so a transistor. So let's focus on the first part, programming the FPGA so that it does what we want. If you are a software developer, then you might find the code that you write for FPGAs very weird. At least for me, it took quite a while until it clicked for me, because you are not writing sequential programs, but you are actually just writing a definition, a description of a digital circuit. The same description languages are basically used in designing real chips like CPUs. And so what you are looking at here is a very, very simple chip that I have designed. This is just the first test to get into writing Verilog code again, but let me try to explain. Like I said, I'm describing the behavior of the chip here. And at the beginning I'm saying, this chip has a few inputs, for example a switch, a button and the clock. So the FPGA board also has a clock signal, which is just 01010101. And I define some outputs, two LEDs and a regular output pin on the board. Then I define some internal registers, so a small memory cell that remembers some values. I already defined a 32-bit counter register, but ignore that for now and a glitch register, which will be the output for the glitch, so 1 power is on or 0 power is off. Now I connect these internal registers with an actual output to the chip. Imagine really wires going from the glitch register to the output, so the LED as well as the pin output are directly connected to the register value. And also I connect the button input to the other LED output, so obviously when the button is pressed the LED will turn on. You see, really just describing how the chip is wired up. Then I set some initial values. These values are set when the device powers on. So the counter for now is set to start at zero, but the glitch power output is one, so turned on at the start. And then comes a block that just describes what happens in each clock cycle. 
every time when the clock signal has a positive edge, so a rising edge, it will do the following. It will take the value in the glitch register and invert it. And you know the glitch register is directly connected to this output pin, so that pin will just wiggle 101010 with each clock cycle. Then you just compile the hardware definition and program the FPGA. And by programming the FPGA, I don't mean it writes some kind of sequential assembler code to some memory. This is not a processor. You can build the processor with it, so it's kind of a layer deeper, but it basically contains a lot of digital building blocks, which will be connected together in a way that it does what you described. So yeah, it's a lot of magic, but it's quite fascinating how it works, so you should look that up. And then we can look at the oscilloscope and see that it works. You see that the output pin here constantly goes 010101. Cool, huh? Now I just have to write a bit more Verilog code to get the behavior that I want. So for example, I want to use the switches of the board to set how long the power should be turned off. So I have to include them in another definition file. Developing this hardware stuff is really frustrating at the beginning, but I learned it on my own a few years ago because I heard that FPGAs are awesome. I think it was just a time when Bitcoin people started to implement mining on FPGAs. The Verilog code is still very short because it's not a really complicated circuit, but let's see. So first of all, everything here happens when the FPGA sees a rising edge of the clock. And then the stuff in here doesn't happen sequentially, it just defines what happens when the rising edge is seen. It's all simultaneously. It's connected wires in a digital circuit, not a program. So if the current state was idle, which it is when the device is turned on, it checks if the button is pressed. If the button is pressed, the state will be set to glitch. So with the next clock cycle, now the FPGA is in the glitch state, where it will output a zero to indicate the power will be turned off and start incrementing the counter. So with every clock cycle, it will now increment this counter. At some clock cycle in the future, the counter will have the exact binary value of the switches. So with the switches you can obviously set a binary number with zeros and ones. So if that is reached, the state will be changed to hold off. By that I mean I don't want to accidentally glitch multiple times after each other because a glitch is super short and when I don't release the trigger button fast enough, it could glitch again. So hold off will output a 1 again so that the power is turned back on, but also use a counter to wait for a while. And when enough clock cycles happened, it will go back into the idle state where we wait for the button press again to perform another glitch. So now we can have a look at that with the oscilloscope. You can see that the power is high and when we press the trigger button, the power will drop to a zero for a very short amount of time. You can see here the scale of the oscilloscope in nanoseconds. And with the switches we can set a counter value to indicate how long a glitch should be. Ah, oh, this looks really good. I think we are ready to go. So now we just have to wire up our target so we can control the power. This is actually a bit tricky because the board gets the power through the USB cable, which also carries the serial communication so we can interact with the board. But let's go step by step. First of all, let's take care of the power. The FPGA board does not run with 5 volts, so we have to use a small circuit to convert the 3.5 volt to 5 volt, which we already did for the power side channel analysis a few videos ago. So I just reused the unidirectional level converter. Looks complicated, but does nothing else than being able to switch 5 volt with a 3 volt signal. And we can hook up now that 5 volt to the VCC, the power in of the board. You can see you don't have to go through the USB cable, you can just directly connect to the power supply. Now we just need to somehow be able to interact with the board via serial. As you know, those Arduino boards have an extra chip on there, a USB to UART, so a serial converter. Which is great because we already have the USB drivers for that installed on my laptop. Now I just take an Arduino Uno that I have and remove the Atmega microchip. So basically now only the USB to UART chip is left and I can directly connect RX and TX to the target board. When I now establish a serial connection with this Arduino Uno board, what I actually do is talk directly to the serial of the challenge board. And here is the complete setup. We have the FPGA which performs a power glitch, which can be configured with the switches and pressing the button will actually do it. The 3 volt glitch output of the FPGA is converted to 5 volt via a unidirectional level converter and then is connected to the VCC, the power in of the target board. So when the glitch output of the FPGA drops, the power supply to the challenge board is cut for a short moment. 
And to interact with the board via serial, we hooked up the USB to serial converter chip from another Arduino. Awesome! Now all we got to do is to connect the serial so we can observe the lock message and then play around with the length of the glitch. You can also see that the power doesn't completely drop like it did before without a target. I think maybe it has something to do with the capacitors on the target board that release charge when the power drops, but it actually is not too bad so the power doesn't completely cut out, but just drops a little bit under the recommended voltage threshold. I think that's better for a glitch. So when you play with it, sometimes you glitch the board so hard that it resets, which is not what we want. And sometimes it even loses the program you flash on it. You can see here that after the glitch it started blinking red, which means the program was lost and the bootloader waits for it to be flashed. No idea why it happens, but you can see that glitches are somewhat dangerous. You could theoretically brick the board if you glitch a critical code path in the bootloader. But when you get the timing right, so the right moment where you want to glitch and the voltage drop has the right length, then magically the loop is broken and the flag pops out. How crazy is that? Soft. Let's quickly recap. The board had an endless loop that will never stop and the flag is printed after the loop, so theoretically you could never reach that part, it's dead code. But we know that microchips can behave weird and miscalculate stuff, for example when the power is below the minimum voltage for a short amount of time. Usually the chip is not operational with those voltage levels, but because we just do it for a very very short amount of time, it won't just stop working, but it just might miscalculate some loop condition. Or maybe skip instructions entirely, we don't really know. I also assume that Riskio made it very easy so that you don't have to actually glitch one exact compare instruction, but they maybe made a lot of calculations and if only one fails it will break out, so that we have a lot of chances to actually glitch something important. But nevertheless, I think it's just amazing. I always felt like these kind of fault injections are very theoretical and unrealistic, but having done a simple one myself, and I'm not even a professional, that was amazing. I hope you can appreciate how crazy this attack is too. I just wish the side channel power analysis challenge would have been on the same level.